Hi, and welcome to the fourth Universalist Service video. My name is Ember Kelly. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of religious education here at Fourth Universalist Society. Thank you so much for joining us for this video. What follows is a selection from our service on July 11th, 2021, Silly Octopus with Reverend Rachel Hayes. In this video, you'll hear selections from the service. Following that, you, we hope you will join us for a lively discussion where we go deeper into the service theme together. You're invited to check out this video and audio podcast each and every week. It's posted on our website, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, as well as your favorite podcast streaming sites. If you like what you see, we hope you will give us a positive review. The likes, the comments, the shares, and subscribing it really helps to spread forth universalist media further. Finally, we acknowledge that our community is gathered on the land of Munsi Lenape peoples. We acknowledge their community, past, present, and future. Fourth Universalist Society acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many BIPOC peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. With this acknowledgement, we seek to continue the process of working to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, white supremacy, as well as other forms of oppression. We invite you to join us in this anti-oppression work as well. Thank you again for watching, and now we begin. The reading today is by 19th century American poet and Unitarian minister, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's an excerpt from his Divinity School address delivered to the graduating class of Harvard University Divinity School in 1838. And now let us do what we can to rekindle the smoldering nigh quenched fire on the altar. The evils of the church that now is are manifest. The question returns, what shall we do? I confess all attempts to project and establish a cultus with new rites and forms seems to me vain. Faith makes us and not we it, and faith makes its own forms. All attempts to contrive a system are as cold as the new worship introduced by the French to the goddess of reason. Today, pasteboard and filigree, and ending tomorrow in madness and murder. For once you, if once you are alive, you shall find they shall become plastic and new. The remedy of their deformity is first soul, and second soul, and evermore soul. Here ends the reading. I would like to begin this time together with an embodied meditation. I invite you back to your breath and the feeling of your body. The breath inside you, the air around you, the bones and muscles holding you up, the force of gravity hugging you into the earth and the structures upon it, the floor and the chair, your own beautiful consciousness playing in this moment. Breathe in, breathe out. Grow long, grow deep, be strong, be here, blessed be. The year I lived in DC, I took a bunch of theater classes. I worked at the theater so I could take classes in their conservatory for half price. I signed up for the principles of realism and 
braced myself for doing scene work in the 20th century to people having a life-changing conversation style. Not my favorite. I had my prejudices and did not connect with what I assumed I would be learning. You see, I was all about the work of poetic theater playwrights like Mac Wellman and setting free the imagination to ask big questions on a tiny budget rather than trying to breathe life into a photograph. Or so I prejudged. The funny thing about this realism and its principles we were supposed to learn was that we had to set free our imaginations to get there with no budget at all. One of the first assignments for that class was to do an animal improvisation. We had to observe an animal until we could portray it in the conservatory classroom. For some reason, I decided I was going to be an octopus. I had only ever seen an octopus once, but it seemed like a thing I needed to do. Luckily for me, there was an octopus in the National Zoo. So that weekend, I went to the zoo and stood in front of that big tank in the invertebrate house, stood there and watched the octopus all noodled up into the upper corner of the tank. It wasn't doing much. So other people didn't stop for long. They mostly paused for a moment before heading on to the crabs or other residents on exhibit. It felt like being in a train station and not taking a train just standing and watching as everyone moves around you. I laid my bag and coat on the floor and decided that I could try to copy the octopus not moving if it wasn't going to move while I was there. It swayed a little bit as it took in water through its gills and propelled it out through its funnel. So I started to play with the idea of being not so much air and bones, but muscle and water. That the water I was in and the water that was in me were the same. That my body was sensing the water all over me and through me. There I was, oh so subtly rocking in place, trying to feel instead of my internal breeze of breath, an internal tide constantly waving in and out. The octopus began moving its tentacles in tiny subtle movements, tip over tip, like shoe tape, shoelaces trying to untie themselves so I copied that motion in my hands and my wrists, delicately spiraling, until the octopus's motion became larger, moving the whole arm. I moved my whole arm, trying to embody that fluidity of motion. I don't know when the octopus saw me mirroring its motion, probably pretty early on because they have excellent eyesight, you know, but it started copying me back. I had done mirroring exercises many times in theater classes where two people face each other and make the same movement at the same time. It winds up kind of looking like this, but this was the first time I had done such a thing with a non-human partner. The octopus made its movements larger and larger until we were dancing back and forth across the front of the tank. I don't know how long we kept this up, whether it was five minutes or 30, long enough for me to get the feeling of the octopus in my body. My focus had narrowed to the tank in front of me. I could not tell you whether the invertebrate house behind me was empty or full of spectators. It was a silly moment. 
silly, not meant disparagingly to myself, but way down in its root as being in the same word family as soul, which is a thing I learned from my poetic playwright, Mac Bowman. Silly as opposed to proper or moralistic or respecting of an external order. Silly as coming from its own impulse. Silly in the way that this play meant everything. <laughs> and absorbed my whole being. My soul was invested in dancing with this octopus. And I think that's because the octopus was teaching me how to move from my center out. You see, an octopus, when it reaches, does not reach with the ends of its arms. The movement spirals from its center until the whole arm or the whole octopus gets where it needs to go. Tips don't operate separately from further up the arm. Everything comes from the center. And we forget that, don't we? While we're so busy moving through the air with our skeletons inside us, we've even created the myth that the octopus can do eight different things at once since it has these eight dexterous arms rather than the unified grace I saw at the zoo. It's almost as though the eight arms keep us from noticing the center. Everything has the center, even the octopus, even us. How do we connect to the center? How do we connect to the soul? Ralph Waldo Emerson in his Divinity School Address called for first soul and second soul and evermore soul to fix what has become stale and rigid in our life together. I don't know for sure that he would endorse pretending to be an octopus in public, but I do know that he was an advocate for the embodied and wholehearted embrace of life. And the only way to come back to soul over and over again is to come back over and over again, to risk appearing foolish for the demands of heart and soul. It's time to get silly full of soul. <sighs> the word has meant childish, pious, and foolish at various points in its history. The best translation I can find for the word silly, as I mean it, as I feel it, is wholehearted. It's time to be wholehearted. It's time to love something so much we let ourselves be beginners. This formula has become my personal theory of everything. When in doubt, how do we lean deeper into the relationship? When called to something bigger, scale up from the center. When something goes wrong, where have we lost connection to the center? What is the wholehearted way to stay engaged? It's time to love people so much we screw up on Tuesday and keep trying on Wednesday. Not for the sake of optics, but for the sake of relationship. Daring to get it wrong in learning to get it right. Learning in public and for the love of God, loving joy, more than wit. It's why we have covenants and not just rules. We make explicit how to create relationships, not just how to break them. It's time to get silly, to love connection more than perception, to be fools together rather than cool to each other. It's time to be all in. It's time to ask the awkward question and listen to the answer. It's time to love one another instead of loving things about one another. It's time to be wholehearted, to jump in rather than hang back. What would happen if we tried to be wholehearted instead of being 
right or good or smart? Who would we be to one another if we dared to be all the way there without preconception? How could we be transformed by our own center? I think of how our life together might change, how we might reimagine justice work, congregational right relations, if we dare to work from relationship rather than an imposed agenda. Just to be clear and everybody on the board calm down, I'm not saying we can't have agendas and procedures, but I'm asking you to do something bigger. Agendas, procedures, bylaws, and institutions, if they are to exist, must serve our relationships rather than the other way around. How do they move from the center out, from that impulse to connect and be in a relationship that acknowledges that you are a whole and beautiful happening in the world, just like I am, not simply my committee member, or my companion, or my coffee hour friend? How do we create the pathways to relationships that acknowledge the heart in each other? To be fair, we are going to screw up. Eventually, we will treat one another as objects instead of the wonders of the universe that we all are. It happens. It happens every time there's a relationship worth having. The way back in is to come back in, to lean into the relationship, the covenant, and say, I didn't take your perspective into account, and I am sorry. If any of you are taking notes, here is the formula. This is how I didn't honor you, I am sorry. Not, I'm sorry if you felt that way, or I'm sorry if I offended you, Nothing in the air, no if, just be sorry. And then do nothing. Honoring the relationship means not demanding a particular response, not imposing your project of how you will make amends. Return it to treating them like a wonder of the universe who gets to make their own decisions and gets to decide how they show up to the relationship. You don't protect your image, you open up. And while you're at it, scale down and be this generous with yourself. Scale up and live boldly into the communities that are part of your life. Scale all the way up and get into beautiful relationship with earth and sky and ocean. It's Time to look like fools, to try something new, to invite the new kid to play, to be the new kid, to forget everyone is or is not watching. It's time to reach out in curiosity because sometimes that which is curious reaches back. And the movement spirals from the center so beautifully, moving past what is probable and predictable to what is real beyond our imaginations. We are called to witness, and the only way to witness is from within, to get real in ourselves and our relationships, to get silly. It's where the joy is, where the heart is, where the soul is. And that is how we come back to center ever more. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Breath of life, beat of our whole hearts. We are called to this moment now. Help us to be wholehearted within it. May our heartbeats remind us to live expansively in ourselves 
and with each other. In the many names and many silences where we find our deepest connections. Amen. I am so excited to get to sit down with Reverend Rachel Hayes today to talk about what I think was a bit of a fun message. Uh, so Reverend Rachel, thanks for uh, sitting down with us today. My pleasure. And thanks for, of course, also joining us as a guest speaker. It's always it's always fun uh, getting to have guest speakers, especially over the summer. Yeah, it's always great to be back with Fourth Universalist. I started there as a member and was there throughout seminary um and fourth universalist is very dear to me and fourth universalist ordained me so that's Ooh. yeah go forth you yes the, the fourth you family the ever yeah. growing ever expanding <laughs> um but so this was a bit of a of a different message last week was about like patriotism and what it means in the fourth of july and then this week I had to pivot from, from thinking about that to thinking about silly octopuses. Um, but I, I really appreciate you bringing a little, a bringing a little levity to, to our summer. Well, I, it's very important to me that we can do both, that we go serious when we need to go serious and that, um, silliness and playfulness um, can connect us to our true selves in the same way as what is the most important thing, right? Um, and, and I also think that the element of fun gives us strength to keep going when things are otherwise hard. Gosh, that, that hits on two, uh, two big questions I had for you. So First, we obviously heard that, you know, acting is something you enjoy, as well as, uh, you know, standing in a zoo and copying an octopus is something you do for fun. <laughs> what are other things that you really enjoy doing for fun that bring that, that joy and centering to your life? Well, it's really interesting that you use the word centering, because the thing that has really sustained me the last couple of years, even before the pandemic, what is um, pottery and throwing pots on the wheel. And the first thing that you have to do when you're making the pot is to center the piece of clay, mm -hmm. right? And so it is, it is a very playful thing. And it's also, it's also the most practical thing in the world to make a bowl that you can then use. Um, and that element of play and usefulness together is really great. And as well as just like getting my hands in some dirt and playing with dirt is great. <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been meaning to, to try a bit more pottery. I, I always enjoyed it back in like elementary art class, uh, but we didn't make very practical things back then. <laughs> <laughs> But it was it was always fun and always a very uh, yeah centering and sort of soothing kind of kind of thing and you know I think uh, creating is definitely a big like thing that can be really um, you know Im impactful for a lot of people in dealing with the, the stresses of life if we can create whether it's pottery or maybe we draw maybe we write you know these these are really powerful ways that we can. Um, engage some creativity and have a little bit of fun in our lives. I agree. I, I think that um, everybody has the capacity to be creative in something that inspires them. And just because it's not going to get hung on the wall in the mat, that shouldn't stop us from doing it, right? This is something, this is part of being human. You can, you can write the story even if it's not going to be a New York Times bestseller. Absolutely. Even if but nobody think, ever reads it but you. It's true. Or if you just publish it anonymously on the internet for everybody else to read. <laughs> exactly. you, you never know what might happen from there. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so after 
this last year that we've had this uh, COVID year, I think that it's even more important that we, that we engage in fun. I know that, um, you know, a, a lot of ministers, a lot of uh, staff people at churches, a lot of congregants as well, we've all been really feeling a lot of the burnout of this has been a really intense last year. And we, we need to, to have that, that bit of fun, that bit of silliness, that bit of, you know, just genuine enjoyment of life. We, we really need that. Has that been your experience as well? Yes. And, and when I, um, when I get in a really funky mood, I have noticed that the thing that really brings me back is taking my dog in for a walk in a place where he has never been before. So even if it's just walking down a different street or something, everything that seems so ordinary to me is brand new to him and watching him experience it for the first time um, is that invitation to joy again because apparently things smell totally different one block over I don't know but he has the best time and I and it it lifts me to watch him doing that right yes no definitely you know watching dogs or we, we spent some time with some cats the other day and they were, you know, just being absolutely ridiculous as cats usually are. And uh, it can really <laughs> uh, provide that little bit of fun. And I know I have um, two little boys, uh, seven and four, and gosh, if they don't, you know, make me laugh pretty regularly <laughs> with some of the stuff that, that yeah. they come up with as well. Um, you know, like I know in the Christian scriptures, you know, it talks about like, to, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be like a child. But I think that it's also just important in our lives that we don't lose that, that childhood sense of like wonder, the same as the dog, a sense of wonder of the, yeah. of the world, that everything can be new and exciting and fun. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love just coming to something that I've never tried before or trying something that I have done before and saying, I am going to do this like it's the first time without, um, without expectations and sort of just put those aside for a little bit and say, I am going to try this for the first time again and experience it in a new way. When I think that a lot of us have that opportunity as we prepare for returning to in-person that um, if it's, it's, it's all new for me. It really truly is new that I started this position during the pandemic. So it's like starting a new job, but we, we have this sense yeah. of newness that we can try new things because we're, we're, we're all headed back into a brave new world. I, I am doing, um, some services in August with my congregation and they're going to be some of our very last Zoom services or Zoom only services as the mm. case may be. But um, I've talked with some of my collaborators about what's going to happen in the services. And I, I said, okay, I would, if we're collaborating on this, we're not going to do it any way that we've ever done it before. Like there aren't rules, except we're not gonna do it the ways that we're used to. <laughs> And, and so we'll just come up with something new and it's a helpful practice to be new, right? Um, and to get comfortable with doing things in a new way, even if it's not perfect, because we have a lot to learn from doing that. Definitely. Well, Reverend Rachel, thank you so much for your wisdom, both in the message, as well as uh, sitting down with me here to to dive a little bit deeper into thinking about the silly octopus. So thank you so much oh, for joining thank today. Thank you, Amber. It's and, been wonderful to sit and talk with you. Yes. And thank you as always to all of our listeners as well. Mm -hmm.